Um, there's a theme that's been on my heart since about May of this year, and that theme is courage, uh, which is kind of where some of the, the message that I'll be speaking today comes out of just me wrestling with that idea, um, because as far back as I can remember, I've wanted to be courageous, you know? Uh, I grew up on a farm, so we had lots of land, lots of places for me to go out and just run around and play, and I remember being like the guy that would go out and imagine the damsel in distress, and I'd go out and courageously save her or take out the bad guys, whatever the case would be. Like, I, that was me. That was my role. And as I continue to, to grow and mature, I, I still want to do that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but no, seriously, I, I, I want to become a, a Christian, uh, a, a courageous Christian man. I want, to, I want to be a courageous father to my soon-to-be-born son. I want to be courageous. And I think all of us in this room, if we're honest, oftentimes we don't feel courageous. Oftentimes we might feel just ordinary. Or like we don't have what it takes to be courageous. Or courage is just meant to be set aside for heroes, right? Uh, well, I, I want to uh, inspire you with this story Um, from a group of teenage boys in 1899 in the streets of New York City. This is what they did. It was called the Newsboys Strike. And these young men, for two weeks, went on strike from delivering newspapers because they were tired of being pushed around and bullied and taken advantage of. So they went on strike, and they went up against these giants, these powerhouses of Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. They said, we've had enough. So they formed a union together. And they went out and they protected their streets. They would not let others uh, distribute the papers. And distributors, the stats just went way down that whole time while they were on strike. And long story short, uh, they challenged the status quo and uh, the labor rights of every child who had been uh, employed by some employer. And they got fair pay. That's what they wanted. They just wanted to be treated like they mattered And their strike succeeded. But I can't imagine the courage it took to stand up to these adults or these union scabbers or the the law enforcement, everyone that came against telling them no and they need to be put in their place. But they had courage. Well, that story inspired a Broadway musical called Newsies. Any Newsies out there? Thank you for the two of you that raised your hands. I feel you. Yeah. (laughs) Love Newsies. And there's one song that's being sung in this musical And it's talking about uh, season the day. And this is what it says. It says, courage does not erase our fear. Courage is when we face our fear. If you're taking notes, I want you to write that down. Okay, seriously. That should be like an anthem for you. Okay, courage does not erase our fear. Courage is when we face our fear because there's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference in our fears just kind of falling by the wayside, and then actually standing up to your fears. Wow. Courage. See, courage has has been over-romanticized, I think, in our culture today. Uh, You can go to the movie theater almost any month out of the year and watch a superhero movie, you know, whether it's Batman or Iron Man or Captain America running around on the big screen. We think that's courage. They're courageous, and that's fake because Hollywood makes things up, so Is courage even real? We think of it as this idea, this thing that can't be grasped at times. But I'm here to tell you today that courage is real. Scientific studies have shown that courage is not something that someone is just born with. You're not born a courageous person. It's a decision that has to be made over and over and over again. And it's not always easy. But courage is is where God wants us to move in, and in spite of our fear, our insecurity, our doubts, our, our low self-image and self-esteem, we can stand up and be courageous people. So my hope and prayer today is that by the end of our time together, you will understand what it looks like to start taking steps toward being courageous. That, that's my hope and my prayer. It has been all week as I've been preparing this message and, and to help us with that, we're going to look for the, the, the character of Joshua, specifically in the book of Joshua, uh, and three insights that he brings from his story. Um, so we're going to start here in chapter 1. So I'm going to read this if you'll follow along. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. 
Now then, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon and from the Euphrates to the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous. That's one. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Two. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. You may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. I think we have one more verse. Yeah. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Three. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. Three times, God commands Joshua, be strong and courageous. Well, the first thing that we learn from Joshua, uh, that he learns from God, is that we have to be given a purpose. We must embrace our purpose if we are to live courageously. We must embrace our purpose. And I think one of the most crippling things that we as humans experience in our lives is when we go throughout life having no sense of purpose. I really do. I think that's one of the the hardest things to overcome is this feeling of there's no purpose for me. What am I doing? What am I doing that matters? Am I even making a difference? Right? I think sometimes when we think about our purpose, we forget the fact that God is there. He wants to give us answers. He wants to fill in those gaps. And we struggle with this idea of purpose. Well, Joshua, he's just taken over the role of Moses. I'm glad it was Joshua and not me. Anybody else? Moses, okay, he's like the guy, all right? He literally, he, he, he helped the, the Israelites escape from Egypt. He guided them through the wilderness, and for 40 years, he led them. He led them spiritually. He led them socially. He's protected them from their enemies. He's provided for them when they needed food and water. He prayed on behalf of them to God, and he prayed for their forgiveness. This is the man who basically did everything. He's been mentoring this young guy, Joshua, to come up after him. And boom, all of a sudden, Moses dies, and here's Joshua. And God comes to him. Very first time Joshua enters the scene in his own uh, chapter, in his own book, we see God speaking directly to him, giving him purpose. This is what he says. I want to go back to verses 2 and 3 so you can see this. He says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. And this is it right here. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. So his purpose, the light switch just went on. Boom. He realizes what he's supposed to do now. He's supposed to go in and reclaim the promised land that God had had promised to the Israelites long before this. Okay, over 40 years ago, a whole two or three generations before, these Israelites were, were wandering in the wilderness and Moses was leading them. And then here we go. It's to the point now where God's like, yes, it's time. Go to the promised land. And Joshua is the leader to get them there. I want to say this really quick. Joshua's purpose did not come from his nine to five job. It did not come from his spouse, the person he was married to. It did not come from his family. It did not come from the expectations of his friends or of the Israelite people. His purpose came from God. And I think in our own lives, if you really, really think on that, where does your purpose come from? Honestly, oftentimes I find my purpose in my job. Okay? Am I, you know, there are times where it's like, hey, is the youth group even growing? That, that's my job is to minister to these teenagers. Well, if my purpose is all wrapped up in the numbers game, and if the numbers aren't there, I'm a failure, according to that logic. For you, are you meeting the deadlines at work, and is that where your purpose is being held? Or maybe it's family. Okay, are your kids getting straight A's? Hmm. If your purpose is to be the parent of all parents, which I don't think any of us can claim that, <laughs> then are, are, how are you measuring up to that purpose? If your purpose is in expectations of others or expectations of, 
uh, family, okay? Maybe you've been burned by people before. If your expectation is that relationships should always be perfect, you've got this, this purpose in there, okay? What, where are you? How are you measuring up to that? My caution is this. Do not let that overshadow the purpose God has for every single one of us. We get caught up in the roles of everyday life, and we often forget to truly pursue God and the purpose that he has for us. I have a kind of a story about that. When I counsel students, when I counsel teenagers who are asking, hey, uh, what am I going to do with my life? That's actually the most common theme most juniors and seniors ask me, by the way. So if there's a junior or senior in your home, they're asking that of people. Just be aware of that, parents. Okay, If they're not juniors and seniors yet, they're going to get there eventually. Be ready for that, parents. Uh, but what am I going to do with my life? What's God's plan for me? Over and over and over again, I hear this question. Well, here's, here's kind of my counsel. Are you praying about it? Well, what is always the answer? Yes, yes, pastor, I'm praying about it. God's not answering my prayer. I say, great. So if you're praying about it, and it's, it's 3.01 in the afternoon, you're at home. Okay, 3.01. You say, God, I just really need, need you to review my purpose. What's going to happen? What happens at 3.02? And they say, well, I just kind of go back to my video games or I go back to, you know, watching Netflix and Stranger Things is coming back in October. I'm excited about that and all this stuff, you know, like they, they, they we all fill our calendars with all this stuff. We fill our time and it gets consumed. So for me, I share this story a lot. Um, I was in college and I was actually being pursued by a church in Anderson, Indiana, where I went to college and uh, hadn't finished yet. And they said, hey, would you come be our student pastor? I said, great. This is like the first interview I'm getting. Like, hey, I'm somebody. I'm getting noticed, right? Okay. Awesome. So I go through a few interviews, a few meetings. I meet with the lead pastor and all this stuff. is great. No one has anything negative to say about this, this church and this experience. I talk to some mentors, some leaders. No one has anything negative to say. Okay, cool. But over and over and over again, I never felt like I heard from God, am I supposed to be here? Is this your plan for me? So, I was inspired by the story of Jacob in Genesis 32. And I said, it's time that I meet God face to face and I, and I wrestle with him. I, I got to know. So I literally locked myself in the youth room there at the church I was interning at. And I said, I'm not leaving this space, God, until you give me an answer. Now, I will say this. I caution you on demanding something from God. Okay? Just know that. Just know that. But I felt at this time that I just, I had to hear from him. I was desperate. They were, they were waiting for an answer. There were deadlines. and needed to know something. So I, I went to the room, and I just laid prostrate on the floor. I said, God, I'm not leaving this room until I hear from you. I was prepared to stay there for as long as it took. About 45 minutes into what I can be only describe as, yes, there were some prayers, but also like just all these thoughts racing in my mind. Anybody ever tried to pray, and you just can't stop thinking about stuff? Yeah. All these different thoughts and things racing through all these different scenarios about yes and no and pros and cons and advice and all these things. I finally just took a deep breath. I said, God, I'm done talking. I got to hear from you. It was right then and there that the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit said, it's not the place for you. I said, okay. Okay. I, I, I'm going to trust that by faith. This is not the place for me. This is not my purpose. So I went and I talked to the pastor. I said, you know what? This is not the church God has for me, and this is not, I'm not the youth pastor that God has for you. So we kind of parted ways. And I, I, honestly, I caught some flack from that. There were some mentors who said, why would you say no? This was a good place. I said, you know what? God revealed to me that wasn't my purpose. So family, I challenge you today, like Jacob in Genesis 32, are you wrestling with God about your purpose? We all ask those questions. Are you wrestling? See, Jacob, when he was wrestling with God, he came away a changed man. First, physically, he was changed because God touched his hip, and he had a limp the rest of his life that he never forgot his encounter with God. Secondly, his name was changed. He found purpose in that identity. God's ready to wrestle with each and every one of us and to reveal to us his purpose for our lives. Are you willing to commit to hang in the wrestling match with him? Now, I will say this about our purpose. Ultimately, God has the same purpose. Let me explain. But God has the same purpose for all of us in this room at, at the baseline level. Okay, the first thing he wants to know, he wants you to know that you are loved. He wants you to know that Jesus came and died for your sins, and he wants to be in relationship with you. 
that's his first and foremost purpose for all of us. So if you're wondering, purpose, question mark, it's way out there. How do I even define that? I'm defining it for you right now. God loves you. God wants to know you intimately. He wants to know your thoughts. He wants to know your concerns. He wants to know your praises and your joys. He wants to be in relationship with you. And that should bring comfort to our souls. We have a God who cares that much, and that is his first purpose. His second purpose is once you've accepted that love and your life has been transformed by Jesus and his sacrifice, he wants you to know that we are on a mission together to spread that love to the world, literally the world. And I don't mean, hey, think about the farthest place you can or that vacation resort that you've been to uh, in Jamaica. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about right outside these doors. There is a world that needs to know the love of Jesus. Before Jesus went to heaven, this is what he said to his disciples. And I think he says, he says the same thing to us too today. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're on this commission together. And that's the, 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 the one baseline, the two things, the one baseline purpose he has for us all. Now, kind of taking a step back from that into what is our individual purpose? What does that look like? Ultimately, I think only God can reveal that to you today. I don't have a word uh, to prophesy over anyone or to share with anyone. Like it's a man who's 32 and he's got a beard and you're working this job at construction. You need to get out of that. Okay, I don't have that today. Maybe, maybe that was for you if that is you, though. I don't know. Okay, But God does have a purpose for each of us. And I think at times it's easy to understand. It's easy to be in step. I think there are times in our lives where we have to wrestle with that. And it's not easy. And it doesn't come quick. But there are still moments where God wants to teach us about him, about his, his purpose for our lives. So I mean that. Take that time to truly wrestle with God. See, Joshua committed himself to his purpose. Once he knew it, he was ready to go. Reclaim the promised land. So here we go. So the second step Sorry, sorry, the first step to being strong and courageous is to embrace our purpose. The second step to being strong and courageous is to embrace our problems. Anybody got problems here you want to admit to? Okay, the four of you that raised your hands, great. Okay, yeah. It, it goes without saying we all have problems. Thank you, Adam and Eve, right? Okay, they sinned first, and they put this curse on all of us so we can't walk or be born into this life and walk around without having sin ourselves. Now, Jesus was the only exception to that rule. All right, but for the rest of us, this is just what we have is sin. We've got issues. And oftentimes these problems that they come, they come to be a part of our lives and they, they kind of camp out there for a while. They become this stronghold. Here's what I mean by that. One of the first things that Joshua had to do once he's on this, pur- this purpose, this mission to reclaim the promised land, he comes up to a really big problem that's in their way. And it was Jericho. Many of you know about the Battle of Jericho, but just in case you don't, I want to uh, show you a couple things about the city. First thing, there would have been two walls. So imagine in your mind the city, okay? The first wall was about six feet thick. Probably not going to break through that just by knocking on the door, all right? Six feet thick, and it was 26 feet tall, okay? That's about how tall. Now, no, this is not 26. That is not accurate, but 26 feet tall, Okay? 26 feet tall, and from there, from that baseline of 26, right behind that wall, things would have started, the city would have started being built up on a hillside, okay? Would have been built higher. By the time you get up to the city, there was another wall surrounding the city. It was 46 feet above ground level. So here come the Israelites. God had commanded them that they have to take the city of Jericho. Now, Joshua, he, he's, a, he's a pretty cool guy, okay? He is a military man. He understands what it means to lay siege and to fight with uh, sword and shield and spear. He gets all that. But God wanted him to take the city um, in unconventional means. So rather than fight that way, he told him, this is what he commanded, go around the city a total of 13 times over the course of a week. At the very end, the walls would simply come tumbling down. Okay? Now, if I were in Joshua's army at that time, I'd be like, dude, you are crazy. There's no way that's going to happen. Have you seen the size of the city? I can only imagine they're probably camped out when the sun sets. The, the big shadow just looms, just goes right over them. Okay, they know how massive Jericho is. This is what God's command is. So I want us to read. We're going to skip around a little bit in chapter 6, but I want us to read some of what happens. 
So the Lord said to Joshua, before they even got there, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. It's before they get there. This is at the very end of their march. When the trumpets sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. And this is what God says to him after. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. The Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. Jericho was a problem for the Israelites as they were seeking to fulfill their purpose. It was a big spot in the way. They could not get past it. It was a heavily fortified city looming over them as they marched. And I think in our own times, in our own lives and times, we can look and see mountains before us. Our problems have taken root, taken hold, and they become these strongholds that we just are crippled by. Here's the funny thing I know about humans because I am one. Okay, I can speak for all of you when I say this. I think sometimes when it comes to our problems, isn't it pretty accurate that sometimes we can just get comfortable with them? Like, think about it. We know they're there, but unless they're kind of rearing their ugly head at us and making us really aware that something's going on, we just, we just kind of pretend that they're not. Okay? We can just pretend that they're not there. We're okay. Like anxiety, you know? We can try to walk around and pretend like everything's fine, and then all of a sudden, boom, we're hit by it, and it's just we're crippled. But instead of dealing with it, we just pretend that it doesn't exist. But every step we take, every path brings us back to the mountain. Okay? Or maybe it's something like fear or doubt or insecurity. Maybe it's, maybe it's your marriage is struggling, and it's easier to pretend like things will work themselves out down the road, or by adding another kid to the family, that'll fix it. Or I'm making more money, that'll fix it. Whatever the case may be, if that's your struggle, if that's your problem, you've got to face it head on, church. Jesus came to eliminate our problems, not for us just to pretend like everything's okay. And I think when it, come, when it came to Jericho, Joshua knew that it had to be taken out. And he really wanted to go and lay siege to the city, but God commanded him, do it my way. How often do we try to take on our own problems, our way, and it doesn't pan out for us. God's waiting for us to look to him and say, hey, I need an unconventional way of fighting this. Are we truly circling our problems in prayer, just like the Israelites did as they marched around Jericho? We downplay these sometimes, and they're just a big deal. When I was in college, I led uh, kind of an accountability group for men who struggled with lust, um, it could have been through pornography or sex or anything kind of on, the, on that spectrum. Um, it actually was very wide-ranging depending on who you were speaking with. And, and every week we met on Wednesdays at 10 o'clock. It was college, so you were still awake at 10, you know what I mean? Now I'm just, I'm out. But, yeah, I'm getting old. So, so we're sitting there and we're in these meetings. And we're all sitting around this table together. And, and we, we weren't coming and confessing these sins and these struggles to to glorify them we were bringing things to light and here's what i know about satan and some of his tactics when it comes to to crippling us in our own walks okay anything that is left in the dark satan use uses it to take root in our lives if you've got this secret sin that you think no one need be aware of satan's only exploiting that in your life he's holding you back from truly discovering your purpose in god I want you to hear that today. But here's what I knew. Each and every week when men who would be humbled and brought to their knees in tears to share what was going on that was real and relevant with accountability partners, who would hold them accountable, by the way, okay? When this would happen, wow, lives began to transform. They weren't just going through the motions or, or hoping that things would disappear. They were actively taking on their, their struggles and their problems head on. They said, enough is enough. Now, I, I want to say this really quick before, before we change gears um, or get too far into this discussion about problems, but when I, when I talk about embracing our problems, when I talk about taking on our problems head on, I don't mean we do it in our own strength. No one wins when that's the case. Okay, Joshua, 
in his own strength, didn't say, hey, God, I love the advice about circling and praying and, and playing music and shouting, but that's not going to work for me. I'm going to take on this, this city head on, and we're just going to go and try to get a hole in the wall and send some guys through, and we might lose a few along the way, but eventually we're going to get there, God. We're going to take it by force. No, Joshua says, okay, God, this is the way you want it handled. Let's do it. And it was God, if you remember the scripture, it was God who delivered Jericho to Joshua, not Joshua who delivered Jericho to the Israelites. So keep that in mind. But these problems, these issues that we have, they're never going to go away. They're never truly going to disappear in our lives unless we can humble ourselves before God and embrace our problems and say, God, this is this is not define me, but I need help. This is crippling, God, but you're stronger. God, I can't seem to get around this mountain in my life. Will you please come in and take over? This is the God that we serve, and he desires for that permission. Sometimes we try to stay in control too much. So our kind of our first idea when it comes to living a life full of courage is we have to embrace our purpose. And out of that, we can't get very far without embracing our problems. And finally, to truly live courageous lives, we have to embrace our potential. We have to embrace our potential. This is something that uh, can sometimes be a little difficult to understand. Um, what, is it, what do you mean by potential? We're going to look again at Joshua and see this, but I want to define potential for our purposes today. And this is what Google tells me. No, I don't use a dictionary to look up my words anymore. I'm a millennial. We all get online. All right? Potential. Qualities or abilities that may be developed and lead to future success or usefulness. I'm going to say it again. Qualities or abilities that may be developed and lead to future success or usefulness. Now, I don't know about you, but I know that God has given each of us, I'm talking personally as well, he's given me potential. It's there. I've been gifted. He, he, he's given me passions and things to pursue, all this stuff. But I want my, uh, my potential to be greater than just usefulness. I want my potential to be greater than just something that can be success. I want it to be everlasting. I don't mean that selfishly or, or like I'm trying to bring more glory to my name. I want to be used by God to be courageous in this world. And what does that look like? Am I just useful to him? Or am I so much more? Am, am, am I ir- irreplaceable? Okay, am I truly leaning in and saying, God, you, you have everything. You are my everything. Father, I want to be used by you. Say it and I will go. Guide me, I will be there. I'm going to show you this picture. It's a picture of a mustard seed. Okay? And, yes, it's very tiny. Uh, they actually measure in about one millimeter to two millimeters in, in diameter. Um, but this mustard seed, when it is planted, it can actually grow into a plant that is 25 feet tall. And it can produce thousands and thousands of more mustard seeds each year. Now, they're very uh, common in more arid climates, so Jesus talked about mustard seeds at times. We talked about the potential that there is in a mustard seed. When it is planted, it grows in this garden and gives shade to the other plants and to the farmers, and it provides homes for the birds of the air to come and nest. Jesus knew the power, the potential of the mustard seed. It's basically unmatched. And unless that seed is cared for and watered and can break through and grow, it's also the potential there is untapped. So I challenge you today, church, when you think about our potential, we're unmatched. God has given each of us such an individual purpose and potential that we just have to recognize it and live up to it. Here's what he says to Joshua in Joshua chapter 3. Okay, I want you to listen to this. Now, this we already know the fulfillment of the promise in Jericho, because that was in chapter 6. But look at here what he says. says, The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. (laughs) What a breath of fresh air for Joshua, right? Remember, he was following in the footsteps of Moses, 
And how many times, three times, God said to him, be strong and courageous. He knew the insecurity Joshua had in taking up this mantle of leadership. He recognized how inferior that he felt following in Moses' footsteps. And he says to them, be strong and courageous. And he says to him, look, I will exalt you. I'm beginning to do it already. Trust me. I am with you just as I was with Moses. That's his promise to Joshua. I can only imagine what he must have felt in the wake of that, laying that wash over and being convinced of that, and then that spurring on uh, his uh, campaign against Jericho. Here's something I know about humanity is that we love to play that comparison game. I'm not as good as her, or I'm not as smart as he is, or they're taller than me, or, you know, God, especially like for me, one of the worst things I can do is uh, talk to youth pastors, and I'm always tempted. Hey, how many you got in your group? How many you got at your church? Oh, you got 20? That's okay. I got 30 in mine. Huh, what do they know? Okay. Oh, you've got 70. Okay, well, I got some work to do. All right? That comparison, when we're comparing ourselves to one another, God doesn't play those kind of games. Your potential can only be held back that much farther when you start comparing yourself, your actions, your intentions to those of everybody around you. Church, I mean this. Family, I mean this. We're all on the same page here. God loves each and every one of us, and he wants us to fulfill our purpose and potential in this life. And yes, we all have problems, but it doesn't mean that any one of us is better than the other. In your job, are you always comparing yourself to, to your manager or to your coworkers? At home, are you comparing yourself to your spouse? Are you allowing your kids to make those comparisons? And when something just flippantly comes out of their mouth, you believe it. Like, I love dad more. They don't know what they're talking about. Okay. So when, we, when we wrestle with this idea that God has potential inside each of us, we have to truly try to grasp what is ours. And here's, here's an example, because I was wrestling with this thought this week. I was like, God, how can I make this real and relevant and, and apply this today? Well, I truly saw potential lived out this summer when we took 16 of our very own teenagers to Chicago. And I can tell you, families in BWC, that had it not been for your investments in their lives, we would not have had the impact that we made. But there was kind of a turning point um, on that day for us, or in, in that week for us. And here's, here's kind of what happened. So we get there on our first morning, and we're told, as soon as we walk onto the campus of this, of this campground, hey, these kids are the roughest of the rough. Uh, they're not going to trust you. They'll have to be earned. They're not going to listen to you when you speak. You'll have to kind of get, get on their level. Um, many of them um, are just disrespectful. Uh, there was a race barrier. We were like 99.9% .9 white, and they are black. Um, there was a socioeconomic barrier where they come from homes where there are 15 kids running around in a two-bedroom apartment. Many of our students come from homes that are, are bigger than that, fuller than that. Both parents are there and they work. There were just a lot of obstacles coming in. I spoke to one young boy who was 11, and I said, hey, are you the oldest in your family? He said, yeah, I have eight brothers and sisters, and they all have different dads than me. And so we kind of knew coming in that there were a lot of obstacles in our way. We had a lot of Jerichos to, to kind of circle around in prayer and move through. I remember we were two and a half hours in, and we sat down for lunch. And the look of defeat on these students, these teenagers' faces, of just like, hey, we, we can't connect with anyone. No one's really opening up to us, and how do we do this? And I reminded them that, all you have to do, first and foremost, is find the one person you can connect with. When you can connect with that kid or that child, you can start earning the trust of more. Um, and I watched how over and over again these questions kept coming up of, well, what did I do here, or what should I do there, or what about this? And it's just, it looked like everybody was about ready to go home. It really did. Um, and honestly, I was feeling defeated because of their defeats. I'm like, okay, got to rally the troops here we go. So we ate, getting food. Anybody just love food? It's a pick-me-up for you. Okay, we ate. That helped us get, get more energized, ready to go. And so uh, we get back at it. 
And by that afternoon, um, a couple of our girls had made connections with a young girl named Tatiana, and she was not ready to say goodbye for the day. So we're celebrating that on our car ride home, and it's just like, yes, that's what it is. Okay, it's that continued steady presence, the continued steady voice of just just reiterating over and over again that they are loved, that they matter, that God loves them, that you're here just to serve, just to help, just to play a game, whatever the case may be. And it opens so many doors. But church, I tell you, I watched over and over again how obstacles came in the way the enemy wanted us to fail that week. And these students were empowered to live up to their potential and overcome these obstacles. And it was life-changing for us and for the kids that we encountered. That by the end of the week we had to go, I wasn't ready to leave yet. And neither were many of our students. They wanted to hang out there longer. I tell you this, church, be inspired by this. 2 Timothy 1.7 tells us that for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You might be sitting where you are today and wondering, hey, where do we go from here? What's next? And so I challenge you. These things, these sins that chain us, cripple us, hold us back, If you truly want to live a courageous life, it's first and foremost comes by knowing our purpose. And I want to remind you, God desires a relationship with you. So if you're here today and you've got that relationship with God and you know Jesus loves you, that is fantastic. You've made one of the best decisions of your life, and we celebrate that as a family. But if you're here today in this church at Bridgewater Church and you've not accepted that free gift of love from Jesus, know this, that he desires to know you. He desires that relationship with you. In a few moments, we have what we call an altar call. We would love for you to come up and pray. And yes, it takes a bold step to do that, but what are we talking about today, right? Being strong and courageous. Are you courageously going to come forward and approach the altar and the throne of God? So, as we wrap up, as we think about these problems that we have all these skeletons we have in our closet that God knows everything about even without us saying anything. So we think about the way we have to to handle them and commit to bring them out of the darkness and into the light. God will be able to move our Jerichos. So we think, again, at these, um, this potential that we have, like mustard seeds, we all have this untapped potential. So I challenge you, don't leave this morning without knowing that you matter and that you can make a difference. God is here. God is speaking. There are many of you around this space today that you're wondering, what is my purpose? Have you truly wrestled with God to figure that out?